Hello and welcome to HITC7s and our new series which is called Ask Me Anything and it's based on the uh, question and answer uh, series, three part series that I did to celebrate the channel reaching 200,000 subscribers. A lot of people said they enjoyed it and asked if it could become a regular feature so um, just you know the idea is that it'll be every two weeks or every month depending on how it does and each time there'll be a different topic so this one is on international football and um, I'll put up a notice saying leave your questions below on the YouTube community and on Twitter if you don't follow us on Twitter. The username is at HITC7s if you'd like to get involved in the future. Uh, fingers crossed YouTube doesn't view this as hate speech um, like it did my video on Monday about the Deutsche Stadion that was supposed to be built in Nuremberg. Don't know if I should mention that. Um, but yeah, fingers crossed on that front. Thank you all for your questions. As always, there were too many for me to answer them all. The video would be hours long. Uh, but I've tried to pick the ones that, again, got the most likes, were reasonably serious. And uh, yeah, without further ado, I shall crack on. Oh, and I am going to read the questions out this time because a few people during the Q&A pointed out that I probably should have done that. So, okay, I'll get started. The first question, or the most liked question, was Do you think Euro 2020 is Belgium's last shot at a championship in a major tournament for their golden generation? Um, no, I wouldn't say so. Maybe their best shot, but I wouldn't say it was their uh, last shot. I don't think their golden generation are particularly old. The likes of Hazard and De Bruyne and Lukaku are, uh, as far as I know, all still in their 20s. Uh, the ageing ones would be obviously companies already out. Um, probably at centre-back, Alderweireld and Vertonghen are what? 34, 30, and 32, uh, maybe. Um, but then, you know, they also have younger players like Thielmans and Thorgan Hazard. So uh, I wouldn't say it's their last shot, no, but possibly their best shot in terms of players being at their peak. Who will win a World Cup first? Africa, Asia, or North America? Uh, I assume a country from... Uh, any of those continents rather than the idea that they'll all sort of merge into a continental team, which would give them a better chance of winning, admittedly. Um, I can't see a country from any of them winning it imminently. And by that, I mean the next probably 16 to 20 years. Um, but then stranger things have happened. I would, between the three, probably... Africa, I would say, without much justification. Um, now I think, I think African teams have. There are some decent ones. I think there might be another question about African teams later on, so we'll, we'll come back to that. The next question is: What do you think about plans for a forty-eight team World Cup? I think it's a terrible idea. Um, I think it lessens the competition. I think it's lessened the European Championships. Some of the group stage games are already at the World Cup. Not great, you know, Saudi Arabia and people like that in, uh, in Russia. So uh, I, I think it's an awful idea. Um, I can understand if you were a fan of a lesser nation or a lesser national team, it would be, um, you know, just the the an increased chance of going to a World Cup, a nation that's never been to a World Cup, um, you the, you would back that. But I'd ask, do you really want to go because uh, they just expanded, you know, what next? Would it be special to go if it was 100 teams that were at it? Not, not particularly, I wouldn't say. Um, so no, I'd rather keep it as it is, uh, but that won't happen because with more teams will come more money and ultimately that's the be all and end all of it. So uh, I think it's a bad idea and I think it'll happen. Outside of England, who is your favorite national team? Um, my favorite national team other than England would be the uh, Jamaican national team or the Reggae Boys as they are affectionately known. That is their nickname and one of the reasons why 
I've just picked them on the spot now. But um, obviously, I don't support a national team other than the English national team. But when I first started going to Hull City games, we had two Jamaican internationals. Uh, Theo Whitmore, who was a sort of lanky attacking midfielder, who was uh, brilliant on the ball, looked completely out of place in the fourth division. And Ian Goodison, who was a centre-back and went on playing, I think, for, for Tramia Rovers until he was about 42. And uh, yeah, they were, my memory just about stretches back to them. And also I went to Jamaica a couple of times when I was a kid. So um, yeah, if I had to pick... Uh, I would say the Jamaican national team. Why do you think Republic of Ireland always seems to underperform? Uh, well, I'm not sure I agree with the question, really. Do do the Republic of Ireland always seem to underperform? I mean, with, in, in all seriousness, um, I'd say they probably perform about what I would expect of their team. Um, Qualified for Euro 2016, mixed bag in the groups, beat Italy 1-0, but, um, you know, and then for the World Cup, they were in, got into the qualifying and were beaten by Denmark, who um, on paper are probably as good or, or a better team than the Republic of Ireland. So, um, in terms of the size of the country, the players that have got, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they do underperform. Uh, in recent times, if you if I had to try and find a reason, you'd say probably they've had a few injuries, um, and and they haven't got an enormous amount of depth. But yeah, if you look at the Republic of Ireland squad, you're looking at a lot of Championship footballers. I don't think it's enormously surprising that that they are where they are in international terms. Um, next question: What? African national teams, no, here you go. What African national teams do you think have the most potential for the near future? Um, what African? Uh, perhaps Senegal, um, if I had to pick one. I think, I believe they've done quite well in the what, uh, under 20. African Cup of Nations. I think they've reached a couple of finals recently and they obviously have some big name players, Kula Bali, uh, centre back and Sadio Mane, um, neither of him are particularly old. So uh, it says, yeah, it says in the, in the near future. So yeah, if I had to pick one, I think Senegal are the one who look probably the strongest. Uh, most underrated international team ever in my opinion. That would be um, the France team of the 1958 World Cup, who are normally remembered, if at all, solely because of Juste Fontaine scoring 13 goals, which is obviously a record for a single World Cup, which will be incredibly difficult to ever uh, be beaten. That, uh, he wasn't even supposed to play in that tournament, Juice Fontaine, it was due to an injury to Francis Dying centre forward, a uh, bit of trivia there. But uh, that France team was um, a, a strong side that made real waves at that tournament and they were only beaten by Brazil, who won. And in that game, France had a player injured somewhere around the 20, 30 minute mark, pre-substitutes, so they were playing with 10. And um, yeah, so uh, I think maybe, I still think Brazil would have won that World Cup, but I think they were maybe the second best team at, at that World Cup and um, very few people talk about them as being a great national team. So I would say they are the most underrated. Next up, what is your opinion on Hungary's national team in the 1950s? And which national team did or do you enjoy watching the most from an unbiased point of view? My um, my opinion on Hungary's national team is that they were exceptional and that it's a grave shame they never won uh, the 1954 World Cup that would have sort of put the crown on that side and which they, you know, really ought to have done. Why they didn't is controversial matter um 
with various theories about what happened in that 1954 World Cup final against West Germany, the miracle of Bern. Um, so yeah, I, uh, an amazing team. The other part of the question, which was which national team did or do you enjoy watching the most, or did you enjoy watching the most? Um, probably enjoyed watching, so I'm taking it whilst I've been alive and not looking back on the games that I've watched. Um, I would have to pick the Brazil team that when I first started uh, getting into football when I was quite little. Um, they had the three R's up front, you know, Ronaldo, Ronaldinho and Rivaldo. Um, Romario was just, just being phased out, didn't go to the 2002 World Cup, which Brazil won pretty convincingly. Um, so yeah, they played with freedom. They were fun to watch. They, you know, I just remember that distinctive sort of yellow kit and they were um, a great team and great to watch. So I'd pick them now. Who would I pick now? Genuinely, probably, even from an, it says from an unbiased point of view, still probably England. Um, brilliant going forward. Scored, what was it, 38 goals or 30, something this calendar year, or the most since, uh, for you know, 90 years, something like that. Um, and awful at the back often. So um, I would rather we were boring and won 1-0 and lifted a World Cup, but we are not. We are very entertaining at the moment. And um, so yeah, if I had to pick now, I'd probably pick England. What is your, oh, I've just read that one out, Jesus Christ. In Germany, almost everybody hates the international break. What's your opinion on the fact that the season is interrupted that often by often meaningless games, for example, friendlies and the National League? Um, hello from Germany. Um, the consensus in England um, is very much the same as what you describe in Germany. Most people do not seem to be fans of the international break. I am uh, an exception to that rule. I don't mind the international break. Partly for the reason expressed in the last question, I find England really enjoyable to watch at the moment. I think the team is quite likeable, they're entertaining and competitive. And it's quite nice to, you know, see see the family at the weekend because it's pretty bogged down when the, when the league's on. So um, I don't mind it. I don't think um, the Nations League is as, as pointless as... As the question suggests, I quite enjoy it. I think it will become a bigger tournament and I think people should just get on board with it. Um, it's far better to be playing teams that are in and around you, testing you. Um, you know, I, I don't think anyone who watched, obviously the question is from Germany, um, but I don't think anyone will have watched England winning away in Spain in pretty thrilling fashion and have thought, you know, this is a pointless game. It didn't feel pointless. I know Germany were relegated in the Nations League, so you, you might want to um, say that it's it's meaningless. But no, uh, I, I don't mind it. I enjoy it. I like international football, and I think it's all right to have a, a bit of a break from the, from the league season. What is your first memory of watching England or any national team game? And I love the content, by the way, Alfie. Keep it up, mate. Um, well, thank you, Josh. Very kind of you. Uh, my first memory, my my very first memory, although it is probably more a memory of a memory being retold or you know pictures that bring that, um, is the Beckham free kick against Greece, which uh, my dad jumped up and smashed his head straight through a light. So. Um, you know, that's sort of been retold as a funny story, which sometimes you, your mind remembers that rather than first-hand. First-hand is the 2002 World Cup, which obviously I was um, in qualifying for that game. But I do remember the 2002 World Cup pretty pretty um, well, particularly England going out to Brazil, uh, Ronaldinho's cross shot. It was definitely a cross. Um and then him getting sent off and England going out. So yeah, I remember that. And I can remember the final with, uh, you know, uh, Ronaldo getting a brace when Khan had just been unbelievable in that tournament. So yeah, 
that's my, those are my first memories of international football. Who do you think would have won the 1942 and 1946 World Cups if they happened? Very good question um, and an interesting one. The um, So I think it still does and particularly more so then when travel was so difficult, it makes a big difference who had hosted those tournaments. So um, if it had been in South America, well, South America and Europe tended to host, or, well, did host all those early tournaments and uh, a European nation tended, up until 58 with uh, Brazil in Sweden. It was always won by a team from the continent in which the finals were played. And I suspect that would have remained. In 1946, in a tournament in Europe, I think England would have won, almost certainly. Uh, although Italy were still a strong team. Um, Italy and England would have been the two. Obviously, England didn't compete in a World Cup until 1950, which was just after England had had a really good team. The England team peaked, and I'm talking ever, in 1948. Um, was strong in 42, even stronger in 46. Peaked just after that, and then had taken a big fall off a cliff, partly because of uh, Neil Franklin leaving in um, by 1950, but also a, a raft of other players, Tommy Lawton, Rach Carter. Um, these kind of players have, have just sort of been phased out. The team changed a lot in that period. So uh, potentially England would have won two World Cups, probably would have lost one in South America, which would have been won by either Uruguay, Brazil, or Argentina, and uh, Italy would have been in amongst it. So if I had to guess uh, who would have won 1940, uh, assuming one was played in Europe and one was played in South America, I would probably say uh, England and either Uruguay or Brazil. I'll say Brazil, seeing as though Uruguay narrowly won it in, uh, in 1950 at the Maracanã. Okay, so the next question. Should the World Cup be held in Qatar. Uh, no, it should not. Uh, I have quite strong views on that. I've expressed them on the channel a few times. Uh, I think it's a, a disgrace and um, not just the means of how it was won, but um, the, the human rights abuses, um, not just since it was awarded. I mean, Imagine that Qatar was a, um, you know, some utopian perfect country that conducted itself brilliantly. Then it got the World Cup and then had effectively slaves working on it. It should be stripped of it then, but it, that wasn't the circumstances. Uh, it was already well known, you know, the some of the laws in Qatar about homosexuality, that type of thing. Uh, I don't think any country that is... Um, that uh, backward uh, on so many issues should should ever have been given the World Cup. Then obviously there's the fact it's tiny. Um, the stadiums will have to be disassembled afterwards. Um, it's not even like it's a sort of Middle East tournament that's being held. I mean, you look you look at um, the USA, Canada, and Mexico have won a bid. I mean, each of those countries has vast resources in terms of stadiums and infrastructure and population compared to Qatar and they're hosting it on three of them. So for such a tiny, um, tiny nation with no real footballing pedigree, um, human rights abuses, both with regards to the World Cup and outside of it, uh, no, I, I would still strip them of it now, but it's not gonna happen. Um, and I really would like to not even watch it. So yeah, I've got quite strong views on that. The next question is, should Jared Bowen get an England call-up? Um, I assume an, another uh, Hull City fan uh, asking that question. Uh, he is fantastic for us, and he may well win an England cap in the future, probably not whilst playing for us. Um, but I don't think so. Not, not right now. England have um, plenty of strength in the flanks. Sterling, Hudson Odoi, Sancho, Rashford, um, go on. Um, and how many championship players are there in the England squad? 
uh, few, if any, you know, no Jack Butland sometimes. Um, so no, I don't think I don't think a case can be made. He should have won a uh, cap or should have made an appearance for the under 21s. He's 22 now. Um, that was wrong, but the first team, I think I'm maybe pushing it. Uh, how do you think the world of football would have gone without either Pele or Maradona? Uh, it certainly, uh, without Pele, would make a bigger difference than without Maradona. Uh, and that isn't a reflection of their uh, abilities or anything. That is um, just a sort of cultural and... Um, Pele was just such a, an alien to football at the time, the things he was doing um, completely changed the game. Obviously Maradona had a huge impact. I think um, if you took out Maradona said he never happened, um, Argentina would only ever have won one World Cup in 78, they never would have won in 86, and Napoli would have remained nobodies. Um, if you take out Pele, um, I think the sport and the way it's played probably looks quite different today. And also, obviously, uh, similar to Maradona, the fate of Santos and the Brazilian national team. It's worth always remembering. Brazil had never won a World Cup before Pelé. By the time he was 30, they'd won three. So, uh, yeah. Both would have made big impacts. Pelé more so. Next question. Do you feel the 1934 World Cup was fixed or were Italy good enough to win it? Oddly enough, um, I think probably both. Um, I think it was fixed. I thought someone knocked on the door there. I think, I think it was um, fixed. It's, certainly it was uh, influenced by Mussolini on referees uh, in a big way. I mean, you know, a dictator having lunch and picking himself, the referees, before a game. Yeah, um, if that doesn't set off, uh, you know, red flags, I don't know what would. Um, but also that Italy team uh, under Vittorio Pozzo was a brilliant team and obviously went on to prove in 1938 that they could win a World Cup without um, getting ridiculous decisions in their favour. I suspect they wouldn't have won in 34 um, without Mussolini's influence, but they, in theory, were good enough to win it. An excellent team, but a, a shambles of the tournament. What do you think is the least talented national team that managed to obtain major success on the international stage? Um, would depend on your definition of major success um to me my first thoughts are the world cup winning it or the european championships or the copper america and when i think of those three i would think the least talented team would be greece in uh, euro 2004 um well organized well drilled knew their jobs worked incredibly hard um had a lot of energy a lot of bite uh, but talented, uh, they were not the most talented um, at that tournament, certainly, or even close to being so. So uh, I may be missing someone, but my first thought is Greece. Next up, we have best international player to ever play for Hull City. Uh, well, it would just be uh, who's the best player to play for City because the best players would be uh, internationals. So, um, Rach Carter is the greatest player probably to have played for City, and Neil Franklin not not far behind. Although Franklin's time at Hull City was plagued by injuries, as many of you will know who have read the excellent England's greatest defender, the untold story of Neil Franklin. Available from fine bookstores everywhere and www.englandsgreatestdefender.com. That wasn't planned. Um, yeah, uh, although neither of them won an England cap whilst playing Fall City, which could be interpreted as being a question, in which case, 
you have asked a good question and I'm a little bit stumped. Um, best international player, it would probably be from the uh, our time, more recent time in the Premier League. Um, although Vigo Jensen, a uh, left-sided player who no one watching this video will have heard of, uh, was a Danish international whilst playing for Hull City and he was an excellent player. More recently, um, Mohamed Diame was really good for us, was still playing for Senegal um, in between his injuries. Um, Giovanni was no longer playing for Brazil. Um, Harry Maguire never not got an England call up whilst he was playing for us. He did, Gareth Southgate did try to call him up, but he was injured. Um, then he went to Leicester and then he got his call up. Um, so yeah, again, probably missing someone. I haven't planned these out. Um, but yeah, if the question is as I first thought it was, I'd say Rach Carter and Neil Franklin. Following that, we have favorite World Cup and Euros. Um, I assume that is to watch, that, you know, just general enjoyment. Um, my favorite World Cup was even though England were awful, I really enjoyed 2014 um, in Brazil. It was the that was the year that I finished school, so that summer was um, finished my sixth form and everything. Uh, I was in Malia for part of it, Portugal for part. It was just a good summer and a good World Cup. Lots of good games from a neutral point of view. James Rodriguez was really good. There was that funny headline in the Indian newspaper. Um, then you had the 7-1 in Germany. So yeah, that was a good World Cup. Euros, uh, Euro 2004, um, I'd have to say. England much better at that. Uh, I went with my dad, I was only little, um, to the England-France game, which we lost in the group stages. We were 1-0 up. And then Zidane scored twice and we lost and um, the French all kicked off. Um, but yeah, um, again, good tournament. Um, Rooney, his best tournament, his only really good tournament um, against Croatia in particular it was memorable. So yeah, that was a good tournament. And then you had a shock win um, and, and Portugal didn't win, having knocked us out wrongly. Ersmeyer, the Swiss referee, ruling out Sol Campbell's goal, as I remember it, was a perfectly legitimate goal. Um, so glad they didn't win uh, after that. Uh, so yeah, 2014 World Cup and Euro 2004. Thoughts on players representing countries they've never even set foot in? Uh, it's very difficult to say. Uh, my initial reaction is that's wrong. Um, but if you are someone whose family has had to flee a country, for example, and both your parents are from that country, then you're going to have close emotional ties to that country despite never having set foot in it. So um, I wouldn't say there was anything wrong with someone in, the, in that circumstance. Um, representing that national team. I think it's it's an emotional thing, and with an emotional thing, it's hard to uh, quantify whether someone's got a legitimate right to represent a nation. So, um, personally, I think I could never represent a national team other than England, even if they said, oh, it turns out you've got some lineage, which means you qualify for X, Y, or Z and it was a chance to play international football. It sounded quite attractive, especially, you know, a warm country. It's like a mid-season holiday. But I, um, yeah, to me that seems wrong. But if you have a close connection to it and you feel a passion for that country, then, you know, how can anyone say no? Uh, next, uh, the penultimate question here is uh, just club or country? Um, so for years I would say club, um, I would always say club up until uh, very recently I wouldn't have hesitated. Um, but 
recently supporting Hull City has become less uh, enjoyable. People feel a bit of a less of a close link to the club. Hopefully that's coming back in a way, but just for those of you who don't know the ownership situation, the stadium's been uh, decimated in terms of uh, how many match attending spectators there are. The atmosphere's really gone from a string of things that they've done, like getting rid of concessions, which are now back, but uh, telling sports they can die when they want, trying to change the name, all that kind of thing. And at the same time, uh, a new wave of optimism with England, you know, the, that penalty shootout win over uh, Colombia is as enjoyable a moment uh, I've had watching Old City for a long time. So, and also, um, if ever there was a time that England could do with the football team raising the spirits it is right now when um, the nation is exceptionally divided away from football and um, so if you had said to me would you rather England won the World Cup or a whole city got promoted uh, for the last 20 years of my life well that's not what it's like two but for the last substantial part of my life I would say um the whole city getting promoted or winning the FA Cup or anything like that but now honestly probably probably England um so I'll say country for now and the last question the first player you think of when someone mentions the World Cup uh well uh, the, the player I just thought of was Ronaldinho for no particular reason um, a World Cup winner uh, like, like I said remember him from the first World Cup maybe that's why he's um, uh, more ingrained in, in my memory I don't know um, when I think of the World Cup I guess you think of like of Pele Beckenbauer Maradona um, those type of players um, who have big, big impacts on winning teams. Uh, Bobby Moore, Bob Charlton, Gordon Banks. But uh, my first thought, which is what the question was, uh, was Ronaldinho. So, you know, can't argue with that. That's it for the uh, debut of Ask Me Anything, all about international football there. Uh, I see the video is over half an hour long. So um, I guess these new... This new series is going to be pretty substantial. Uh, please do keep the uh, recommendations, advice, that type of thing coming. Obviously, people said try reading out the questions, uh, which I've done. But um, I appreciate any more advice. It's a new type of video, and uh, I'm receptive to that. So thank you all for watching. Uh, give us a like if you enjoyed the video. Make sure you're subscribed. And uh, keep your eyes peeled for um, part two. And if you have any suggestions about what part two should be about, the second instalment of Ask Me Anything, um, let me know in the comments as well.